back out there? Yeah. All right, good, because I'm tired now, so that is <laughs> praise the Lord. Amen. Good to be uh, back in the house. How many guys just love Jesus today? How many just excited about Jesus and the message and, and uh, his message, what that means uh, in our life? Uh, amen. So um, we're going to get ready to get into you know, the message and I'm going to continue to keep praying for uh, you know, Pastor Mike, uh, and uh, you know, I'm gonna mess with him when he gets back. You know, so I can tease him to say, you know, see these new preachers that go to London, and, you know, <laughs> they got the preachers in LA. Maybe he's gonna take new preachers in London. I'm glad it's on tape too. That be good. What's up, bro? How you doing? All right. <laughs> Amen. God's good. Now we just want to keep praying for them. They have safe journeys as they. Uh, come back. And then we're going to be talking a little bit today about a family affair. I'm going to say a family affair. Family affair. We're going to be talking about relationships and, and uh, how it uh, interacts, how we can interact with our uh, family relationships, how we deal with the interaction. How many know that there is no greater proving ground for where you are with God in your own personal family? Yeah. How many know that, right? Amen. That uh, you can uh, speak in tongues with the best of them. But that family situation is going to test where you at. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, about that. Let me just pray for us as we get ready to get started again. Lord, we just want to say thank you that you've been so good to us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Lord, we thank you uh, that you are interacting with us uh, you are so vast, you're bigger than anything we can imagine, yet you choose to engage with us uh, who are very small. And uh, we say thank you. And uh, Lord, as we take this time to think about your words and how they apply to our lives, we ask that your spirit would speak to us what you would have us here today as your church and uh, strengthen us, Lord, that we'd be able to lift you up in a greater way. And our families and in our relationships. We say all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going to be going to uh, the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter. Uh, Luke, the 15th chapter. I'm not sure exactly what page it is in our in our church Bibles, but we do have it uh, up here on the screen for those that want to uh, read along with me. And Jesus says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off uh, for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion uh, for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms at, around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, uh, but I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fat calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Amen. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Give me a little bit more on this mic. Because um, I'm pretty sure my voice is going to start to go. I'm not going to scream at you today. That's why I screamed at you during the worship. <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit today. Let me first ask you say, we're going to talk a little bit today. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a family uh, affair. I think it's, it's always important for us whenever we're going to begin to start thinking about uh, the, the words of Jesus and the message of Jesus for us to be able to uh, sit it within the context uh, of, of Jesus' message. 
and, and what he was communicating both to them then and to us now. Uh, everyone that kind of heard Jesus, Jesus came and he was speaking about the kingdom of God, right? It's important for us to always remember that, that Jesus did not come to establish a religion, but that Jesus came to establish the kingdom, uh, the kingdom of God. This whole uh, reality that uh, had been prophesied for four or five hundred years that one like the person was going to show up and, and he was going to make all things new. He was going to make the high places low, the crooked places straight in a way that all flesh would be able to see God's glory. That, that God was making all things new in the world, that all the brokenness that had happened in humanity's experience, God was going to reset the system. And so Jesus shows up as the one who says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. This reset is here upon us. And the reason uh, I think it's important for us to, to think about that as we're thinking about our relationships is to understand that all the stories that Jesus told us were told within the context of what I call the reset. The kingdom that, that Jesus says, uh, it's been said to you before like this, but now I tell you we're going to do it like that. You've once uh, practiced in this way, but now I want you to begin to experience in that way. Uh, in this kingdom reset, Jesus wants to move us just from spiritual practice into a spiritual journey. Right? That I think is a very important thing for us to do. We as people have a tendency to be transactional. Right, and, and I think God is more uh, interested in being transformative in our life. That God doesn't want to just deal with us, right? But that God wants to engage with us. Look at the person next to you and say, God wants to engage with you. And so if God wants to engage with us, then I think also God wants us to engage with one another. And so I'm going to talk to us a little bit today uh, about how we deal with our, our family. When Jesus is here, he's moving that dial into a new type of way. And our faith then needs to serve as an electrical uh, conduit instead of a switch, but an electrical conduit that God's love would flow through. Uh, God, I don't believe, wants our spiritual engagement uh, to just be like uh, a light switch, right? That, that, that uh, we're on today. We're off tomorrow. Serving God today, but when I go home, I'm deal with stuff the way I want to deal with stuff. Right? You know, when the praises go up, as soon as we get in our car, you on my nerves. Right? You know, you know, Jesus in me. When we get in the car, Jesus ain't in you. Right? So we got all, we got all this kind of stuff going on. Right? In terms of how we deal with each other. So we want to think together on, on how his message uh, helps us frame that. It's an interesting story for us to use in that, particularly because uh, the, the parable of the lost son is normally thought about and used in the context of us understanding lostness, understanding uh, our uh, position in terms of, of uh, going away from God's will and, and God being there to rescue us. And I, I believe there's a, a lot of gravity in that and that we need to continue to embrace. But I want to invite us to think about this passage also a little differently. Just to reframe of the story, we have a son who asked for his inheritance early. And this had a lot of um, uh, context then, particularly because in the, in the Hebrew culture, the Jewish culture, the sons worked with their father uh, all their days, working in, in some of a family camp, and a son asking for his inheritance and leaving early would be choosing opportunity over relationship. And the son says, give me my money now. I'm really not concerned, Dad, with, with what's going to make you strong throughout the rest of your life because I want my money and I want to go pursue the things that I want to go pursue. So the son leaves uh, his father in a weakened place. And the son goes off and he uses his resources to do his own thing. I like the way they frame it uh, in the King James Version. They say he went off on a riotous living. Right? You know, he was kind of making a little bit of a mess, right, with his life. And he goes in and he makes a mess, and at a certain point, he runs out of money, he's, he's broke as a joke, you know, his, his change is very strange, and, and he realizes, right, you know, that I've got myself caught in a situation. So he goes uh, and gets a part-time job, a full-time job, working with the pigs. And there is where this passage 
where we're going to focus, uh, picks up with him, uh, beginning to have uh, an engagement and a thought process that I think will be helpful uh, for us as we think about how to deal uh, with our families. One of the things that's important, uh, I'm going to give us three R's today as we think about our relationships with our families. When this young man found himself uh, in the pigsty, I love the way that the scriptures say it. It says that uh, in the King James, it says he came to himself. In the NIV, it says he came to uh, his senses. Uh, the first R I want to talk with us about is realize. All right. When we are engaging in uh, our familiar relationships, the reality is we're going to make a lot of bad choices from time to time. Or people in our family are going to make bad choices with us. Now first I want to focus, when we make uh, bad choices that, that uh, create problems in our familiar relationships, we've got to realize when we've made a mistake. Amen. That dishonors our familial uh, relationships. Uh, one of the lines that uh, I've heard, and, and Pastor Mike has probably shared it here, uh, we, we talk about it often, that we've got to be careful that we don't become in love with the beautiful lie. Right? Sometimes we are in the middle of a mess, but we don't want to admit it. Sometimes we've injured someone that we're in relationship with, but we don't want to admit it. Right? Because we're like, well, it's not my fault, it's their fault. You know, if they would have did this, and if they would have did that, then we wouldn't be in this situation. But a lot of times we are making mistakes and we need to realize when we've made a mistake that dishonors the relationships in our family. The reason we need to do that is we also need to realize that dishonoring our familial relationships actually dishonors God. Amen? Amen. It's not one of those happy sermons. That's why I try to get y'all happy earlier, because I'm not... <laughs> I knew what was coming. But when we dishonor the relationships in our family, we actually dishonor God. I love the way that Jesus frames it when he talks to his disciples. Is he says, they're not, they're going to know you. He doesn't say they're going to know you are my disciples by uh, uh, how many sick people you can heal. Or how many uh, dead people you can raise. He doesn't even say they're going to they're know you're my disciples by how many people you can disciple for me. He says, they're going to know you are my disciples by the way you love one another. Yeah. Right? That Jesus actually lifts up that the love and the interaction that's going on in your familial relationships has great gravity, great, great uh, uh, weight, I should say, for what's really going on in your spiritual journey. I love the way John, one of his disciples, uh, says it in, in, in one of his letters. He says, if you say that you love God and you hate your brother, John says you're a liar. I don't even know if I love how he says that. That's kind of harsh. But it's helpful. <laughs> right? John says, if you say that you love God and you hate your brother, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. Right, that they lift up for us that how we deal with our family has a lot to do with how we're dealing with God. I love the way Paul says it, where Paul talks to us in Ephesians 6 about honoring our father and our mother. So on the screen, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you. You know, I, I, I didn't say this in the, in the first service, but it, it kind of applies since he's sitting here. If there was any scripture, my father I was told that's growing up. And I'm going to channel his voice if I still got the voice for it. Son, y'all got to honor your father and your mother. That y'all days, not my days. I don't know, my voice is gone. I can't do the high part. But, <laughs> but how we honor our relationships in our family have direct effect on our spiritual engagement. Amen. Am I in the book? Amen. And it also lets us know, even when we're in the role of a parent, to the one that's there to shape our children and in this familial engagement, that we need to make sure that we bring them up the right way. God is looking at how we deal with our familial relationships. So we've got to be able to make sure with the interaction that's going on in our family, being able to pay attention when we're in the pit stop. Yes. 
See, a lot of times, you know, we're rolling around in the mud, as I mentioned earlier with the beautiful lie. We're rolling around in the mud because we don't want to admit we're in the mud. But a lot of times in our engagements with one another, we are in a bad situation. And so the first part, everyone say realize. We've got to realize when our relationships look like this. We've got to realize when our choices have led us to a place like that and we have got to realize that and be willing to admit that we have made a mistake. It's only when we realize that we've made a mistake and we realize that dishonoring our relationships in our family has great weight with God that we'll actually be in a posture and a place to be able to do something about it. I think one of the things that's important as we're engaging with one another is our faith drives us to see what our part in the situation is. I love the way Jesus says it uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. He, he says, why are you trying to get the splinter out of your brother's eye when you've got a two by four in your own? First, remove the two by four in your own eye. Then you can see clearly what is going on in your brother's eye. In our relationships with our family, we must be willing to realize when we've injured someone, when we've made a mistake, and we've got to be willing to do what needs to be done in order to get there. The second R is repent. Everyone say repent. repent. Now, this is not, I'm not going to talk about repentance the way you think uh, about repentance, because repentance doesn't just mean confession. Repentance also means to change your mind, to turn away. We've got to, when we realize what we've done that has injured the relationships in our family, we've got to be willing to change our mind about our initial posture. So that we don't continue to re-injure the relationships that obviously God holds so dear. We've got to make sure that we repent. You know, when I was pastoring, uh, you know, if there was anything I probably counseled on, it was relationships. I was a collegiate pastor, young, young adult, so, you know, we're getting, you know, everyone, you know, that I was working with was like 18 to 35, 18 to 40, and all the drama was always about relationships. One of the big reasons being because as human beings, we don't like to say we're sorry. Right? And here's one of the classic things. I had some people sit in my office and say, well, I apologize. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, I remember I had one brother in the office. I said, can you just say you're sorry? He, you know, he was like, I'm, you know, I apologize. You know, right? Or we have that classic example where we go, I apologize if you feel right. like I did something. Because, you know, I didn't do anything. But if you feel like I did, right? If you have an issue, I want to go ahead and throw you this little apology to hopefully help you out when you go home and work that out, right? That is not repentance. Right? Repentance is to own what we've done and turn away from the posture to say, I not, not only am I sorry for what is done, but I am willing to address the mindset and the behavior that got us into this situation. That in our familial relationships, we must be willing to realize when we've messed up and repent, turn away. We must also recognize that what happens in our relationships with our family is not just sin against one another, but it is also sin against God. I love the way the prodigal son uh, says it in his story. He says, I have sinned against my father and against heaven. You know, the, the picture that we see in that, and I love the picture that continues to come through Calvary, that all of our engagement is always about a vertical connection and a horizontal engagement. I always get very, very, you know, concerned when, when people, you know, only want to have a vertical interaction. I got my personal relationship with God. <laughs> right? Being God on a whole nother level. You know, I don't need to, you know, uh, deal with that because me and God, you know. And, and you know, there's a line I, I've shared with folks. Be very careful when God starts agreeing with you. <laughs> Just a good marker, right, for like how much you're hearing God. If God is always agreeing with what you think, that's not God. <laughs> right. You know, listen. I know we just saying that we are friends of God. 
but we not God, right? So we got a friend and we need God to give us some instruction, right? So we need to be willing to repent. We need to be willing to take responsibility for what we've done in our relationships. I believe that the Holy Spirit comes upon our lives, not just for us to run, dance, and shout. Yes. We should do that. That's great. We can we can run around and and, and down, dance and shout. I'm 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 still a a, 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 a pure born Pentecostal guy. You you turn on some loud music, I'll probably run around and foam at the mouth for at least a good sixty seconds <laughs> before I realize I'm dignified. Okay? <laughs> but but the Holy Spirit doesn't just come on our lives to be emotional and to engage and for the practice of worship. But the Holy Spirit comes upon our lives, right, so that we can. Empowered to deal with these deep waters of relationship. One of the things that should be unique about the people of God is we should be the ones, because we are fueled by Holy Spirit over human instinct, that we have God's power to be able to not run away from the challenging human interactions, but we should be powered by the Holy Spirit to have courage to plunge into deep waters. I would submit to you that the Holy Spirit wants to engage in your life so that you have the power to repent. Mm -hmm. yes. The power yes. to turn away from a mindset that can be harmful and, and destructive for your relationships. So we need to realize when we've injured, when we've hurt those with whom we love, those that we want to engage with, and then we need to be willing to repent, to turn away from the things that have us there. I love the way David says it, with all of his family drama. David, in Psalm 51 says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. In our family relations, we've gotta be willing to repent, take responsibility for when we've injured folks. And in order to do that, we've gotta be willing to humble ourselves. <laughs> We've got to be willing to bow our heads. You know, the, the, the definition of humility uh, that I use, that humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking about yourself less. Did y'all catch that? Humility is not thinking less of you. It is thinking about you less. And in our family relationships, we have to begin to think, how in the middle of conflict and challenging situations can I think about myself less? and think about my family member more? How can I honor my family member in this situation instead of seeking to honor myself? Years ago, I heard uh, a, a, a Bishop, uh, Bishop Garlington from uh, Ohio speaking, and he said something that stayed with me to this day. He said, our success should be to see our brother succeed or our sister succeed. What would it look like if on a daily basis in our relationships and family, we made our success to see the other person succeed. Wow. That in interacting with one another, because we choose to humble ourselves, we're not trying to win, but we're trying to honor. Yeah. We're trying to serve. Yeah. We're trying to lift up. But that's why we've got to be willing to repent because that mindset is not the mindset of the world. The mindset of the world is to win. Nice guys finish last. Dog eat dog. But Jesus calls us to humble ourselves and repent. So we want to realize what we've done wrong. We want to repent by changing our mind and our posture. We want to repent by displaying humility and accepting a lesser role. One of the things I like in, in this story is, is that when the, when the prodigal son is, is in the pigsty, he humbles himself to the point of being willing to accept a lesser role. He says, I'm going to go back to my father and just be a servant. I started off as a son, but by the way that I have injured our relationship, I'm willing to come back just as a servant. Y'all know how we get sometimes. We don't want to come back as a servant. We want to come back the way we left. I know we had an issue, but you know, if I'm going to come back, you're not going to be holding that over my head. 
you're not gonna be reminding me all the time, like, you know, because listen, you know, man, I'm a man, right? You know, I'm a man, you know what I mean? And, or, you know, I'm a man, whatever, right? <laughs> I wanna come back the way I left. We've gotta be willing to accept, everyone say, accept the lesser role. Yeah. Some of y'all didn't even say it, some of y'all <laughs> We've gotta be willing to accept a lesser role. To be an agent, one that will be able to bring about redemption, reconciliation. Now, the stuff we're talking about, this is very dense material. Particularly because this, as I'm talking about your family members and how we put this into practice, all of us have faces popping up in our minds. <laughs> right? Some of y'all sitting there like, oh, I'm being, I don't care what you say, huh? <laughs> Hallelujah, peace, I'm out of here, right? But the reality is, how we engage with our family relationships is how we engage with God. Mm -hmm. There is no greater proofing ground on what we believe about God and the world than how we exercise that in the context of our relationships. You want to worship God? Work at it in your family. You want to honor God? Seek to do it in your family. You want to learn what forgiveness looks like? Learn to practice it in your family. You want to understand redemption? Learn how to redeem others in the context of those that are closest to you. Am I in the right church? So we want to, we want to realize, we want to repent, and the last R is we want to respond. We need to respond to our awakening that we have made a mistake. We need to respond uh, to the fact that we've realized that we need to change our mind. And the way we respond is to make the effort to seek forgiveness. One of the things I share with folks often is that we do better instead of seeking to be understood, we should seek to understand. Seek to understand. How can I see it from the other person's point of view? The son could have easily said, well, listen, man, I mean, stuff was all messed up at the house, and I had an opportunity to go into the far country, and if I would have doubled my money down, and you would have been all excited about that, and then you would have thrown a party, he, you would throw a party for me because I was so successful. Why are you getting mad at me just because I tried to take an opportunity and follow my dream and go out here, and now you all, you know, we, we could go there, or we can respond to our awakening and seek forgiveness. The son says, I will go to my father. And then it says, he got up from where he was and he went to pursue relationship and reconciliation. We've gotta be willing to seek forgiveness and something that we talk about in addiction, we've gotta be willing to make amends. We're not going to restore family if we're not willing to make amends. To build back up in the areas where we've torn things down. And we've got to be willing to be the initiator in making things right. This is dense material. we got to be the initiator. A lot of times we sit back and we say, well, you know, I, I, you know, I hope they feel it better. I'm willing to make it right, but we got to come 50-50. Y'all know what I'm talking about. If I take one step, you got to take one. Now, you didn't take a step. You didn't take a step. I'm not doing it. I sent, I sent her a Facebook. She didn't send me one back. <laughs> so I did it, Lord. Praise the Lord. I did it, Lord. <laughs> we need to be the initiator in making things right. God is calling for peacemakers, not peacekeepers. <laughs> It's easy to be a peacekeeper. It's a little subjective kind of peace. We cool. You sit on that side of the church, I'll sit on this side. <laughs> Just don't bother me. Right? But we've got to contend through the Holy Spirit to make peace. Be an initiator in making things right when you've done wrong. And equally, when you've been done wrong, we must be committed to be an agent of reconciliation for our family members who need forgiveness. 
It takes a lot of courage to be an agent of reconciliation, particularly when we've been violated. This is dense material. Because everything that I'm saying sits inside your individual context. That, that is complicated. Here's the thing, this human life is complicated. It's very, very complicated. Human beings are very, very complicated. And the reason I say that is because oftentimes we, we're used to watching sitcoms, right, on TV. So we, we feel like we can solve everything in our life in 27 minutes. <laughs> Right? We're watching too much TV. We start off with a little funny thing. Urkel comes in, he knocks the pan over. Did I do that? All right, we have a good laugh. Then Family Matters has a big conflict in the middle of it. But by the end, by that 24th, 25th minute, they solved whatever calamity they started with. Music cues up. Mm -hmm. They have this little emotional moment, and then everything is right. And we get up and go get our snack. But how many know life, <laughs> life is not lived in Family Matters? Yeah. Life is very, very, very complicated. So we must be committed through practice and through uh, the Holy Spirit and through community to be agents of reconciliation, to work at it, to be willing to get up from where we are, not knowing what lies down the road, but be willing to be courageous enough to seek the opportunity to both receive forgiveness or to be an agent of reconciliation. One of the things I love about this story as, as I start moving towards the close is the father. The father who had been done wrong. The father who had been abandoned. The son's uh, departure was a huge violation in their culture because it was economically, uh, uh, it was an economic attack. It was an emotional abandonment. And it says that when the son was coming down the road, the father was out waiting for him to embrace him. And we sang about we were a friend of God. What does it look like for us through the power of the Holy Spirit to try to really be like our friend, God, and learn to be an agent of reconciliation when we've been violated? How do we learn how to stand on the road waiting for our family member to come to the end of themselves and seek forgiveness and then be willing to wait there to be an agent of restoration? Mm -hmm. Leave a person next to you and say, this is dense material. <laughs> this is dense stuff. But this is where we live our lives. We don't live our lives in when the praise is. We don't live our lives in. You sing that once a week. For about 120 seconds. Woo! And that's it. You don't wake up in the morning when you're having an issue with the person in your family, with your brother who just did whatever that he did to you. And when y'all start having an issue, you don't start singing when the praise is the love. It's not what you start doing. It's not where we live life. So we're going to have to ask God to give us the power through his spirit to both seek forgiveness when we need it, but also to be that agent of restoration. He comes home and the father doesn't just receive him, but he embraces him. He hugs him. He kisses him. And then he restores him. He takes a robe, puts it on him. He puts the ring back on his finger. He restores to him what the son gave up willingly. And he gives it back to him and says, let's celebrate. Because the relationship that I have lost, I am active. I'm going to use my own power to restore someone who is broken. Now again, as I say all this, all of this is sitting inside at least 40 or 50 situations that are going on right now. You're thinking about people. You're thinking about, oh, how does that work? How do we do that? I submit to us that this is what we need to be going to God about. This is what we need to be talking about with each other. That we would aim, we would seek to practice forgiveness and reconciliation. I love it how it shows up in the story of Joseph. 
Joseph was the brother. Some of us uh, may know the story. His brother sold him into slavery because they were jealous of his dream. And they sold him into slavery. And for 20 years, Joseph missed all of his, what he was rightfully deserving. 20 plus years he missed with his father. 20 plus years, birthdays went by, festivals went by, where he had to grow up in a whole other country, sold, trafficked, sold away. And 20 years later, his brothers come into the palace where Joseph is working and sit down with him asking for help. And they didn't even recognize him. Can you imagine the level of pain Joseph felt? You sold me into slavery and you forgot what I even looked like. The person next to you say, dense material. <laughs> That's heavy. You forgot what I looked like. But Joseph tells them, as an agent of reconciliation, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. It doesn't mean that the injury was right, but that Joseph says, I'm willing to see God's ability to work through what you did, and I'm willing to partner with God as a friend to help restore our relationship. What would it look like if we became agents of redemption, reconciliation, and forgiveness? What if God was giving us his spirit so that we would have the power to live a different kind of life in the context of our family? I know a lot of times when I talk, I'm always talking about the community. But I think sometimes we might not be able to do some of the things that we might be able to do in the community because we first need to learn how to do it in our own family. So we must be willing to cross the street of indecision and pride, I would say, and fear. We've got to be willing to cross the street and go engage as an agent of reconciliation to restore those relationships. Who is it that's in your life that maybe God might be calling you to forgive or seek forgiveness? Recognizing that how you engage in your family relationships is how you honor God. And I talked about that sitcom a little bit earlier as I get ready to close. I talked about that sitcom and, and, and I would love, it, it would be wonderful to just stop the story, you know, right where, uh, uh, the father is putting on the coat, he's got the ring, and normally that's where the music cues up. I've got the coat, I've got the ring, God bless me, bling bling. Right, that, that's normally where the story ends, right? I don't know where that came from. <laughs> but the reality is that even when the son sought forgiveness, he still had the engagement with his brother. It's a part of the story I didn't read. When the elder brother comes in and is a little upset, why are we celebrating Junior? He left. I've been here the whole time. You gotta recognize that even when you seek to be an agent of reconciliation and redemption in the context of your family, or when you're seeking forgiveness for things you've done, doesn't mean everything is gonna work out perfect. We're not called to perfect the interaction. We're called to have courage to be involved and engaged. And we're going to go and seek forgiveness with folks that aren't going to give it to us. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Amen, somebody. Amen. But we're still called to go and to engage. And the fact that people don't want to give forgiveness and don't want to engage doesn't make them a hater. I don't want to preach that message. When you even try to do what God wants you to do, some folks are going to be a hater. All right. That's, that's one perspective. There's another perspective that when people get injured or when people feel some kind of way about interaction, <laughs> folks are a little bit slower in their process of being willing to give forgiveness. And we must be patient. Man 
manage our expectations. Be willing to accept a lesser role mm. that God might use us as an agent of reconciliation. This story is not true because it happened, but because it happens. We're going to continue to make choices that hurt folks. We're going to continue to be hurt by choices that other people make. But when this happens, may we realize what we've done. May we repent, change our mind and our posture, humble ourselves and be willing to take a lesser role. And may we respond to be agents of reconciliation or be ones who pursue that second chance. Come on, stand on your feet. I want to pray for us.